Good afternoon. Welcome to the Mary H. Weiser Center monthly webinar, focusing on the social and emotional aspects of living with food allergy. I'm Kim Menzel, the communication specialist at the Michigan Medicine Allergy Clinic. My position is funded by a generous grant from the Mary H. Weiser Food Allergy Center. The center is now recognized as a Discovery Center of Distinction by FAIR in recognition of our advances in biomedical research into the origin and treatment of food allergy. Visit uofmfoodallergy.org to learn more about our current research initiatives and the progress our scientists are making. Send your questions to Leanne and Allie today through the Q&A function. We'll answer throughout the hour. They want to hear from you. So today we are joined by two well-known food allergy travel advocates and writers, Leanne Mandelbaum and Ali Bon. Thanks so much for joining me today. Leanne, you are the mother of a young adult and very talented competitive tennis player with a peanut allergy. You're also the founder of No Not Traveler. You've collected hundreds of testimonials from families on their travel experiences and continue to fight tirelessly to institute a bill of rights for food allergic children and adult passengers to ensure all airlines carry epinephrine auto injectors aboard without question. No Nut Traveler offers travel tips and links to articles written for many publications. And just recently, everyone check out her June 15th article in Allergic Living, describes a recent incident on a transatlantic flight, further illustrating the case for mandatory epinephrine auto injectors aboard all flights on all airlines. Allie, as the founder of Miss Allergic Reactor, you are also a tireless advocate, and you share lessons learned firsthand from years of international travel as a person with multiple food allergies. You're an educator, global travel consultant, and coach, and recently joined Food Allergy Science Initiative, FASI, as a project manager. You were just featured last week in a Washington Post article about travel coaches and how they can help people travel safely. Your blog takes your followers with you on your travels from Thailand to Greece and everywhere in between. But both of you share a common goal to empower people to live their lives fully and safely, which is why we've asked you here today, because I know you're going to give us specific tips and tools that our audience will immediately be able to use. You've collaborated together with global and domestic partners patient organizations, researchers, and each other to advance policy and empower the food allergy community. Can you each share what motivated your activism? And Leanne, if I can ask you to start us off. To unmute. Sorry, am I speaking now? Can you hear me? You sure are. Okay, I was speaking before to nobody because I was muted. So um, we were waiting to come home from a vacation and the person sitting directly behind us heard me tell my son he couldn't go into a store that was making fresh peanut butter fudge. And she politely asked me if he had a peanut allergy and I said he does have a life-threatening peanut allergy and she proceeded to say, well, you better move away from here because we're all going to be eating peanuts. And I took that to heart, you know, we're in the departure lounge, I can move, I have a choice. And, and so I moved. But unfortunately, her three children followed me started throwing peanuts up in the air, missing in their mouths on purpose, and then crushing the ones that landed on the ground and pushing the dust towards my son who was eight and laughing. And, and so knowing that she was going to be on our flight, I went through the chain of command at Denver airport and the last manager looked at me and he looked at Josh who was eight and he said if you think he's going to die I just don't get on the plane which at that point my eight year old who had never been scared of his food allergy carried his auto injector with him and happily went about life became terrified and he said mom you can't put me on the plane the man says I could die I'm only eight I have my life ahead of me and Long story short, we didn't get on that plane. I came home, I did a Google search, far more worse stories than myself, decided that there was nobody out there really doing something about that and bringing the community together um, in a way that collected all the stories going on. So I drew up a sketch for my website and I launched it approximately three weeks later and, and here we are. <laughs> and uh, we've done a lot of good in the world and there's a lot of good still to be done. So that, that, that's the uh, backstory.
And that was about eight years ago. That was eight years ago. Yeah. There's a lot that's happened since, but I'm assuming yes. we'll talk about that later. Yes. So, Allie, why did you create Miss Allergic Reactor? So back in 2008, I had um, I had gone to a conference and met a whole group of moms who had young kids with food allergies and was sharing about all the things I you know grew up doing. Um, you know, from going to school and summer camp and having playdates and you know all of the normal kid things to traveling and um they wanted me to share my story and so i started blogging sort of in the early days of blogging and um it was really because of this group of moms who just were looking for to hear from adults with food allergies who'd grown up with them and that's where it began <laughs> so there was an incident in florence that i know you brought up when we were talking could you share that the almost, almost almond handshake. <laughs> uh, Leanne and I were at a conference together uh, in Florence on, on food allergies, fam. And we had, she was introducing me to a group of allergists at the conference. And one of them, which is very common at conferences, food allergies are not, uh, bowls of nuts and all sorts of, you know, food is out on the table. And I had just seen him take um, a handful of, of almonds and put them in his mouth. And then we're talking and introducing ourselves. And he goes to shake my hand to meet me. And I was like, actually, <laughs> I'm allergic to almonds, um, but it's really nice to meet you. And um, we went on from there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's sort of a common thing to happen if you, you know, see somebody eating your allergen and just sort of figure out a way around it. But, you know, Leanne was right there with me at the time. Um, and I know it was uh, an interesting moment for her to witness. Yes. I mean, I, first of all, just to see, walk in with Allie and realize that here we are at the European big allergy meeting and realize that like, like she said, bowls of, of nuts are everywhere. So even at the if you're not, if you're going to see that at an allergy conference, of course, you're going to see it at other conferences, right? I mean, so I, you know, I'm a licensed physical therapist. And whenever I take uh, continuing education courses, I, I do actually think of Josh because I see the rows of nut snacks as, as options. And so I was really impressed with how Allie handled herself. And it was, it was a good moment for me too, as a mother, because sometimes like I'll go to these physical therapy conferences and I will look and I'm like, oh my God, you know, what's it going to be like for Josh, depending on what he chooses to do in life. And then I'm like, no, it's really okay. You know, you have your toolbox, you know what, obviously you're not going to shake someone's hand. You, you learn how to speak up and say, actually, no, I'm allergic to what you just touched. And I think that's one of the most important things watching Allie and traveling with Allie gave me is, is um, a sense that Josh can do this and public speaking such so important like so important to model early on like this I mean we we when we go to restaurants he's 16 now so he's he I now he I try to let him do it all by himself but when he was maybe 11 ish 12 ish I really started saying no you need to order but then I would help him you know so it, we went through transitioning and, and now he pretty much does it himself where he just had, you know, an independent sleepover at somebody's home and they went out to breakfast and I didn't have to, I was worried, but it went fine, you know, just, just things like that. Thank you for bringing that up, Leanne, because the idea of transitioning to independence with food allergy is something that we always come back to because it doesn't just happen. Okay, you're 16, you, you know, you know what to do, go. You gave him lots of practice opportunities so that in a safe setting, he could make mistakes, he could be unsure, and he could develop that confidence in the skills. So we're going to talk more as we go on about both of your best communication tips when you're, when you are having to, or you're teaching Josh to communicate with others and Ali, how you've communicated with others. Can we start, what are your best tips for safe travel with food allergies? Can I hear from both of you? What are your top three recommendations and tips from all of your years of experience? What would the top three things you would want people to know that they can do? And Leanne, can you start us off? Well, the, the, the very, very, very first tip, and 
is to carry your auto injector wherever you go, um, along with you know a letter from your doctor saying you have a food allergy and your action plan. But you you must have it with you. I was recently told a story. First of all, we could go back to the article you talked about that I just published for allergic living, where the doctor cracks open the kit and there's no epinephrine. There doesn't even have to be epinephrine vials right now. The FAA has quietly been granting exemptions to airlines for five medications amongst them epinephrine. The FDA recently told me there is no shortage, but still sometimes they're not in the kits. So the airlines have this loophole and we don't know what's really in the kits. So your backup will definitely not be there in the form of an auto injector unless an airline voluntarily carries it. And it may not even be there in a vial. So it's very important. And the story I was alluding to was there was um, a woman traveling and you know, these days you get on and sometimes if you don't pre-board, there's no room in the overhead luggage, right? So they took away her carry-on and she ended up having a reaction on that flight. Her auto injector was in that carry-on. She ended up having to use a borrowed epinephrine injector because the vials were there, but there were no syringes. I mean, so the state of medical kits is not something you can count on, but you can count on carrying your own medicine. I always say bring it in a box with its original label. I know a lot of people use like, like we do too. We have like a, a carrier, but I keep the boxes. I actually don't throw them out and I carry the empty boxes with me. And just I've never been stopped, but just in case that's an issue for security. <laughs> the second most important thing, and I know Allie and I will probably overlap on this is do not take an airline meal, no matter what assurances you have. So we flew 14 hours to South Africa. They even brought me a sealed meal that said not allergy on it. And I said, thank you, but no, thank you. You know, this is a risk we can completely eliminate by for Josh, we don't have a lot of sugar cereals in our house. So I bought boxes of cocoa pebbles and whatever junk cereal he liked. We asked the stewardesses for milk and we covered the tray so there would be no crop. We washed, of course, we wiped it down, which is important. And we went on our way safely. I, I never, I think we discussed this in our little preview. I've never heard anyone walk off an airline and say, God, I wish I could die in there again. I mean, it's just not worth the risk. You could bring your own food. It might not be fancy, but you'll be safe. And also in that carry on, have non-perishable foods with you because there could be a delay. There could be, you know, so many things happen. I was on the runway three hours coming back from a conference the other week and then we took off and then we had the flight right and they actually it wasn't during a meal and there were no you know it was a no frills there were no, there were no meals i mean luckily i had some snacks in my bag but what if you have a food allergy you know that's that's not something you can't count on other people having safe snacks for you so like what if your checked luggage gets lost don't put all your safe food in there because at least you have like a start in fact when we went to south africa i put a little in my suitcase carry on a little in my each of my kids so that if if for any reason our luggage got lost with our backup food that that we would be okay and the third one is in the united states we now have the right to pre-board so that came from one of the testimonials from my website where um someone was denied pre-board on an american airlines plane because they used to have a policy in writing that specifically said if you have a peanut allergy you cannot pre-board the aircraft we challenged it and um, DOT was, we were successful with DOT and they said American Airlines violated the Air Carrier Access Act. So now any plane coming into the United States and any plane leaving the United States has to allow you to pre-board or they're violating DOT bylaw. And Jim Baker, who's um, at the head of University of Michigan, Center. He was instrumental when he was at FAIR at, at helping us get this through. And we have, I have such gratitude because it, it wouldn't have happened between, you know, myself, the testimonials, Mary Vargas and, and Jim. So it was a group effort. So those are my top three tips. Thank you. Allie, what are yours? I mean, all the ones that Leanne mentioned are also <laughs> top tips of mine as well, um, along with checking expiration dates on your EPIs and making sure you feel comfortable with the number that you have. Um, talking to your allergist about what they think, depending on the type of trip that you're going on um, and how remote you are, depending on where you're going. Um, along with that, um, something that I also recommend besides pre-boarding, which I think is also really helpful, especially for families, um, because you know, having that extra time with the kids to be able to wipe down the area, not feel like you're being rushed with everybody, um, coming behind you 
I, I think that's important to have that time. It's also important because you don't want to have a situation like Leanne is talking about where your bag gets stowed somewhere and you forget that you have your medicine in there. You want to make sure that you have that first of all on you and not in your um, bag that, you know, you're going to put in the overhead bin. But just in case you also want to, you know, not have to worry about that happening. And if you pre-board, then you're pretty much guaranteed to have plenty of space to put your bag. Um, Something else that's important if you're traveling abroad to a country, you know, where you don't speak the language, having a translated chef card or translated card that says your allergens so that you can give that when you go to a restaurant, um, that's very helpful. And something that I tell people a lot is really focusing on what you can control because it's very easy to focus on the things that you feel out of control with when you're traveling and to focus on the things that you can control, whether that's, you know, um, being able to pre-board, whether that's packing extra snacks like Leanne's talking about, so you don't have to worry about finding something safe to eat. Um, especially, you know, it sounds like a bit of a crazy summer right now already with travel and a lot of delays, a lot of luggage issues, and to know that ahead of time and plan ahead for that, that's something that you have control over. Um, so really focusing on those things that you can control, because there is actually a lot of things that you have control over. I wanted it's, to add one thing yeah. to agree on. Um, I, I just want to get lost in the shuffle. The way that we speak to flight attendants and flight crew and gate crew, I think Ali would agree, um, our tone, because it can get really, really difficult to not get angry. Because I mean, I collect the testimonials where we're mocked we're belittled. They don't want to let us take precautions and they're, they're often rude. and. and Part of that is the stress of the job, and it's not easy to be in the air these days. But the other part is they're not educated on food allergies. So mm -hmm. no one has told them it's not a runny nose. Nobody has educated them. I went to a breakfast early on given by Swiss Air, and like this man came up to me that had like three degrees and spoke five languages. And he's like, I want to help you with this because I have hay fever. I understand food allergies. And it wasn't, you know, he was not belittling me. This is what he, you can't know what you don't know. So we don't want to be thrown off planes, you know, and I was almost just asked to leave a plane with Josh going to a national tennis tournament just for revealing his allergy on an airline that has a policy that says we may help you. It also may not help you, but it says you can ask. So just for asking, I mean, they tried everything to get me off that plane and just being able to not react to it, I think it is really, really important. So I, I just wanted to put that out there because you know if you raise your voice and if you get into a confrontation the only thing that's going to happen is you're going to get kicked off and you're going to have no recourse because everybody says well sue 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 if you read that contract of carriage and your airline ticket you can't sue you know it's they're thickly insulated so so we you know yeah. you can write a strongly word letter afterwards you could do all those things but if you need to get where you need to get and you know keep that in mind yeah 100% agree with Leanne. That's a really good point and something else that, you know, that I talk to people about as well, because I, there's countless times where I've had to talk to re sort of talk myself on to be able to stay on a plane just when I have let them know that I have a nut allergy and um, just asking if they're serving nuts, not even like asking to make an announcement, like really the bare minimum. And I've had to uh, talk to them about letting me stay on the flight. So you really, it really is, it's a very tough balancing act, I think. And, um, and tone is, is absolutely important. So we're all aware there's sometimes in life that things don't go as we planned or hoped. And for food allergies that may be experiencing a reaction, or as you're talking about communication challenges with restaurant staff or crew, will you each share an experience and how it helped you grow into more resilience and feeling more capable, not less? Uh, either of you, please lead us off. <laughs> well, I, I could talk about my last experience because as harrowing as it was, you know, so, so like I said, I got on the airline and all I did was I said, I wanted to tell the people around me, I, just like Ali said, I didn't ask them to suspend anything. I just wanted to tell the people around me and they, their body language changed immediately. And they began to tell me that you know, United was the nut airline and it was someone's right to eat nuts. And who was I 
to be able to tell other people and maybe I shouldn't just fly. And then they got the pilot who pretty much said the same thing, huffed off to find the gate agent who was going to, again, see if we should fly. And in the meantime, they bring me back to the galley and they show me this meal, Thai chicken, and they say they're going to feed it the entire plane. And all Thai food has peanuts. So gleefully, they said, obviously, you can't fly with us. So they were really baiting me. And it was important skill to learn not to take the bait, right? So I was like, you know, it looks really processed. I don't think there's an allergen. And again, you've got to do your research. That's probably one of the things I should have mentioned in the tips, right? So I know United doesn't serve peanuts. They do serve tree nuts. And that would be maybe a problem for somebody with the tree nut allergy, but my son has outgrown tree nut. So we are concerned about the peanut. And so I, you know, politely said, it says on your website, you don't serve peanuts. You know, so I'm really not concerned about this, but I was curious, like, do you know what's in the food? They had no ingredient list anywhere. And it wasn't because I was concerned the meal had peanuts. I was very curious to see if they had these lists. So just again, to talk about the airline meal and not taking it, they don't even know what's on it. There's no lists. You know, it's definitely not a mistake you should make. But in the meantime, the captain came back to me and he said, well, do you have an auto projector? I'm like, of course I have six. And then the flight attendant gleefully said, well, you could just use the pen then. I could even serve peanuts right around you. And at that point I could have said something to them, chosen to raise my voice. I mean, it was, they were really trying to pull my strings. And I looked at Josh and he's like, please, like wanted to go to this tournament. We wanted to get there when we were getting there and it, it wasn't worth it. So again, knowing when you just, it's not the time to have the battle, but look, I mean, here again, it, it, it infuses me with a drive to educate the airline staff because obviously they don't know what they don't know. And when we took off, they didn't make the announcement. They refused to make the announcement. And when we took off, they were serving drinks to someone three rows behind us. And the person said there was an emergency landing three weeks ago because someone on an, had, you know, was exposed to a nut on my flight. Two minutes later, they come and they make the announcement. So sometimes it's better when it doesn't come from you. I'm not saying there's always going to be that person, but, you know, again, knowing when to quit, knowing when you need to be where you need to be and, and that really inspired, inspired me. And it, it gave, I felt like I've grown so much since my original experience with United. And I also now have a community, you know, I've created this community so that we're not alone in telling these airline stories and you bringing me on here and everybody that's listening, you're not alone. You know, we are here to help all of these resources. I mean, Megan has you know, tackled so many important topics, psychosocial, not just tra tra uh, traveling. So, I mean, there are so many resources for you all out there that it doesn't be as, have to be as scary as it was for me eight years ago. And I hope I've contributed to that. Allie, we got a viewer question. What about traveling to places where a foreign language is spoken? Would a card with allergens written in local language be useful? And I'm just wondering if you've ever had a time that it, um, things were complicated or didn't go as well because of a language barrier or? <laughs> sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it sometimes can be tricky, certainly. Um, having a translated chef card is huge. That's a major help. Um, now we have, <laughs> back when I first lived abroad, I did not have a smartphone and things were a lot more challenging. Now, you know, we have so many, apps that you can use Google Translate is huge. It's a, it's a massive help um, as far as deciphering ingredients. If you're at the grocery store, for example, or on a menu, um, I think the most challenging part sometimes with dining out uh, and when you are somewhere where you don't speak the language is deciding if they really understand the severity of the food allergy. Um, and that can really vary from place to place and um, depending on where you are as far as also where you're dining if you're you know right in the touristy area or if you're somewhere that is um, you know a little bit off the beaten track it, it really it really depends. Um, I've had thankfully really good luck I think that um, overall but I've had a lot of practice with it and I think when you have um, the chef card that's translated I also like to put pictures on on my chef card when I have it when I translate it um, and I have like pictures of my allergens and they're crossed out. Uh, so that's, you know, a pretty universal thing to be able to look at a picture. Um, 
of, of, of an allergen and uh, understand that that's not okay. Um, so that's been a huge help, but yeah, it's, I think it's really building blocks as far as comfort goes with traveling internationally. You know, if you are someone who hasn't traveled much um, at all, like even in, you know, wherever you're from, the US, the UK, Canada, wherever you are, um, you know, getting some of that local travel in first and getting comfortable with that is really, is a really important first step. And then you can build from there. You know, I've done so much travel at this point that pretty much anything is comfortable to me but that's because I have so much under my belt at this point. And that was not always the case. I mean, I remember some of my first um, travels internationally and certainly as I grew older going by myself and, um, you know, there are definitely some very nerve wracking moments, but as you continue to have that practice and build on it, it gets a lot easier. So, yeah. And you think of a time it did not go as you hoped at all and maybe was pretty scary and, how did you get through that? And I know we're getting questions about how do you manage anxiety around that? And I know you talk about that on your site and in your classes. And it, so how did you manage any anxiety after something went really got derailed? Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's been a few times, but I think the first one that really comes to mind is when I was I had lived abroad in Australia and I went back with boyfriend at the time to travel. And um, we had already probably taken at least 10 flights over that trip. And we were in uh, Alice Springs, like, which is, you know, the middle of the country in Australia. Like there's nothing around there. You have to fly. And there was just Qantas flights. And um, they, I had just told them, like, just asked if they were going to serve any nuts and that I had a nut allergy made it, you know, just, very calm tone, like Julian and I are talking about, but you know, that just to, to sort of make sure that I felt comfortable. And um, the pilot ended up coming out to me, having asking if I would sign a waiver and and almost taking me off the flight. And I was like, there's no other way for me to get to where I'm going. Like I have taken your airline the entire trip. I have lived here and taken your airline. And right now, like what is the difference between this flight and all the other flights that I have taken? Um, and so as upset as I was, frustrated, anxious in that moment, and they weren't even, I don't think, planning to serve nuts, but they didn't like the idea of me being on there with an allergy. And um, I remember feeling so frustrated that that they had, they wanted me to sign a waiver, that they, you know, had all of this in place that, you know, in case something went wrong, um, even though I just asked one question. <laughs> um, so um, I was able to talk my way on. I was not comfortable signing the waiver. And I, and I said that, I said, there's no reason for me to sign this. Like I have flown on your airlines and have not signed anything before. And I was just asking if you're serving that, so I will be fine. Um, and, but it took convincing and I remember feeling so frustrated after that. Um, and, you know, when I saw Leanne starting to, when we first connected and I saw her doing all of this advocacy towards airlines, you know, I, we first connected on, on Twitter and it was, you know, it was so awesome to see somebody out there who understood how challenging it can be and, and how people can not either not take it seriously or take it to an extreme. So, um, you know, it's really, it, like I said, it's really a balancing act. You don't ever really know how somebody is going to respond. And that's part of the challenge and why education is so important, why the advocacy that Leanne does is so important. Um, and, and yeah, getting, just trying to have tra food allergy travelers be as informed as possible so they know what they could potentially be walking into and how best to handle those situations. So one of the viewers wants to know, Leanne, if your son and Allie, if you wear an allergy bracelet or something that identifies, ah, there it is. Have you always done that? Is yeah. that something? Exactly. So that's a, that's a strategy you use. Allie, you should tell people that you're not just allergic to nuts, by the way. I'm not. Yeah, no, I have quite a, quite a long list. List, list, it, list it because it's yeah. more impressive. Oh. <laughs> Uh, no, like peanuts, tree nuts, fish, most shellfish, potatoes, 
banana, kiwi, some other legumes. Um, what did I forget? Mango, tahini, I react to. Um, but the you know four of those are the our top eight allergens, and then you know a number of them are not. Um, but the four top eight ones I've had anaphylactic reactions to. So. Um, so traveling internationally, those are all foods you're going to encounter Certainly. a lot. And so how many international trips have you made? Would you guess? Gosh, I have no I mean, idea. Dozens. <laughs> so many. And dozens. I lived abroad for years. I lived in Italy for three years. Um, I lived in other places for shorter stints of time. And yeah, I've traveled to so many places. I don't feel like allergies. And, I mean, one reason of writing and sharing and doing what I do, helping coach, you know, families to be able to feel like they can travel safely is, is because I know that you can do it, you know, and I have done it myself. I know through practice, I knew through all the strategies and tools that I have learned to use and um, just all this experience that I have you know, I know that anybody can do it. There are ways to make it happen and that there's no reason to not be able to explore and have adventures and go where you want to go. There's always going to be a way to make it work. There's no reason to miss out. Yeah, and I mean, just watching her do that. Um, we we were both at that conference and, and we met actually at the conference before that, which was the International Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis meeting that Mary Jane um, at Michigan Actually, she's now at Michigan, but she, but she brought us together in that sense. Um, and um, just even watching her with that bowl of nuts, I know it's and not eating anything at that reception. And the two of us went out to dinner afterwards safely. She doesn't make it about the food. Like she wasn't, th that meeting was about meeting the physicians. And often I think you can like relay that back to travel. Like, we, when we went to Israel, there was, and we were on a group trip with my sister who had arranged it for my nephew's bar mitzvah. And they took us to a place where my sister had vetted it and it was not safe. There were peanuts everywhere. And they basically told me, you know, he can't eat safely here. So he and I sat on the bus and he again had his sugar cereal. I mean, we had backup with us, but we didn't make it about the meal. I'm like, okay, you and I are going to have cereal for lunch. How much fun is that going to be? And I think Allie has that kind of attitude. Like it's great when we went out for dinner and we totally were celebrating. It was, it was my birthday and we went out in Italy together and they gave us this great meal. But when it came to dessert, they're like, look, we just don't feel comfortable making you anything. We were getting give you like a really pretty fruit plate and not being disappointed at things like that being like that's great we had this fabulous meal it's not about you know you could sing happy birthday to a pineapple with a candle in it it doesn't matter I still have that candle alley which he told us <laughs> to wait for good luck it's still on my uh counter and it, it just it, it's about the memories and not it's great if you can get the food it's an added bonus but if, if it's not safe knowing to say knowing to say if it's not safe I'm not going to eat it and I think Allie's really good about that yeah, hundred percent. It's definitely not about, I don't make the travel about the food. It's great when you can have, you know, we had some awesome dinners and, and great experiences dining out. Um, but it, it's not about the food. It's, it's so much more. There's so many things you can experience that have nothing to do with the food. And, you know, I've gone on some trips. I went to Vietnam. I had not planned that. It was an afterthought when I was in Thailand. Um, did not have a translated chef card prepared and told myself, like, I have, you know, sort of rules for myself internally of like, okay, if I don't have a chef card translated and I haven't really like done my research to figure this out, I'm not, I have enough food packed and I can go to the grocery store, but I am not going to dine out while I'm there. And that was a rule that I made for myself. And that was totally fine. Like, it was not about the food. I had incredible experiences, so much fun and, you know, learned so much, had such a good adventure and it was definitely not about the food. So there's always ways to make it work, whether you're packing all the food or you're, you know, figuring out a way to dine out safely. You know, if I did it again, I would have a chef card and I would have done more research ahead of time to be able to do it um, and feel safe. About it. But I knew my limits and I knew that that's not what I felt safe doing. And I, I will absolutely stop, you know, stop where I know I feel safe and not push anything farther than that. We have a question. If either of you, and I'm sure you both have worked with people who are dealing with dairy allergies and they said, how can you travel internationally with a dairy allergy? 
I'll, I'll take Go ahead, it. Allie. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know, you know, dairy is not one of my allergens. And I know I have worked with families who have the dairy allergy. There have, there is a lot more options now available, depending on where you're traveling, of different types of milk, um, which is, which I know has been helpful for families to know about. Something that I love to do is to, wherever I'm traveling, to go into the grocery store and make videos showing what you can find. And I think uh -huh. for all of the top allergens, not just for my allergens, but I look for um, you know, what's available for, for any of the, the top allergens that I'm thinking of, um, just so that people can see. And, uh, you know, I understand the dairy one can be really tricky. And I think is it's, you know, each allergen has its own challenges or not. Um, but uh, the dairy ones, I don't know it personally, I could try to relate as much as I can to understanding what it's in. I still think that, you know, something that I do even for the nut allergy is listing out all the different types of nuts on my chef card, on my allergy card. Um, and I think for dairy, I know, as I've talked to people that work with around the dairy allergy, you know, having things that are listed that people might not think of um, that dairy is in, you know, having butter on there and having different things that people don't necessarily automatically connect to dairy. And from, you know, my research and who I've talked to um, and parents and families, you know, I think that that's a big challenge is that people don't connect them or they think that dairy and egg are the same thing. I know that that's also a common challenge. So, um, and also that, you know, people think like, oh, lactose intolerant and not that it's a, you know, anaphylactic allergy. So right. um, very much aware of those things. I know it's not my own personal challenge, but it's something that I try to keep in mind when I'm traveling because I want to be able to help everyone as much as they possibly can. So I'm trying to think of like, if you have this dairy allergy or if you have an egg allergy, what are the options and what, um, you know, what can people order? So I've known a number of families who have traveled with dairy allergy successfully. Um, I've helped some people with dairy allergies travel successfully. It is definitely possible. And I think it's becoming um, a little bit easier depending on like Europe. Uh, I've seen a lot of different types of, of milk in the grocery stores before. <laughs> Well, um, I have to say you just have to be very careful, both in the U.S. and worldwide. The vegan label, from what I understand from presentations that I have seen, it can contain traces. It doesn't, it, vegan does not mean allergy safe. And actually someone just posted a picture on a plane that the vegan meal they, you know, ordered for their child who they thought they would go with vegan because of her milk allergy and it came with a glass of milk and a croissant, right? I mean, so again, you know, don't rely on the airline staff. They have no idea, none, none whatsoever. Because um, vegan can be very misunderstood. Yeah, People yeah, don't understand. In grocery store, you might yes. think it's safe to pick up that vegan muffin or, or whatnot. And it, it just, vegan does not have to go by the same standards as you know, a, a true food allergy. So just being aware of that. I, I wish I had more flight experiences to share with you. I'm, most of the stories that have been shared with me have been reactions to nuts or shellfish in the air. I, I had one egg story worth an egg sandwich back when they actually used to cook things on the plane and it was steamed from an egg. I have a specimen of stories, but I actually, it's not saying that they're not happening, but I have not, I do not have collected a lot of, of stories with dairy. And if anybody has positive or negative, I would urge you to share your testimonials with me on the website. Cause I, I can't share with legislators and with other advocates what I don't have. Absolutely. That's not my experience. I, I, again, I don't have the stories personally to share. That's one of the questions that we have is how can I get involved? And it sounds like that's a really important way is share your stories so those can be communicated and and legislators people who can inform policy can understand the breadth of the issues and and really you can't ignore someone's specific individual story like what happened on that transatlantic flight that it's you can't ignore the realities when so many people are sharing and that sounds like one way. What are other ways people can get involved to help? 
make differences in, you know, across industries, how we, how we can more safely pre prevent tragedies around food allergies. I mean, right now, sharing the stories is the number one. We, we need data. And um, actually, I'm going to be launching a survey with um, a bunch of other interested parties soon. And I'm going to ask everyone in the food allergy community who flies to take the survey so that we can try to show airlines, um, amongst other things, that you know, when we're doing a search for a flight, it's not just necessarily about the price, not that that doesn't enter into it, but we of course want to know that they have a good food allergy policy. So, you know, making sure that you take the time when you're asked for any research project, whether it's around travel or, or something else that take the time when someone has worked on some, I know I've been working on this almost six years, so you can't even imagine, you know, the work that goes into this. So take the 10 minutes if somebody mm -hmm. asks you to share this because that getting data can really um, implement change. Um, also, I think supporting those airlines, if you can, price-wise and products that are friendly, I, that, you know, putting, putting your pocketbook where, where this is, you know, I, I've made the, I, sh I look back on that United experience and the reason we chose it is because my son's being recruited and we wanted on the way to this tournament stop at one of the colleges that uh, coaches that wanted to meet him and United had the best schedule, but there was a JetBlue flight. It just, we couldn't have done it. And, and maybe in retrospect, after that experience, in fact, after that experience, we, we, where we have an upcoming tournament coming up, we do have JetBlue booked when United did have, we were not visiting anyone. So it's just a question that United is, you know, maybe a little cheaper and has a little more flights. And you know what, we, we chose JetBlue because, because we know we're not, it's again, the risk reward. We, we know we're not going to find the same outcome there that we might have. Um, it does look like some of the airlines are, are hearing us. I, someone posted a picture of, of, um, red plate granola on American Airlines, even though they have a very unfriendly policy to those still with food allergies, they're starting to serve a top eight free food in their breakfast gear, and they now carry obacues. So, you know, also understanding change is slow, but write your legislator when you have a bad experience, you know, because they don't know about it if, unless we tell them. So there's all sorts of ways, you know, what do you we have mean? a question, which airlines do we know, you know, from the data that we have, which airlines are currently the most responsible and accommodating? Have you both found? Here, here's the problem. Airlines are consistently inconsistent. And so I could have a great experience on JetBlue and you could have a terrible experience. I, the reason I collect the stories is so you can get an idea and look and make an informed decision. But one of the reasons I don't rank or have a list is because you just don't know the proof. We had a, before we on that United flight, we had three positive United experiences, yeah. you know, where they did do the announcement, you know, since our original bad experience. And so, you know, it, it's very hard. The, the thing is to look at who has a policy in writing. So British Airways has a great policy in writing. Um, JetBlue has a great policy in writing. Delta has a great policy in writing, but of late, they've started to somehow decide that peanuts are a really important food allergy and they'll make the announcement to clear the plane and, and have no one eat it, but they won't do it for tree nuts. You, you don't know what you're going to get for tree nuts. That's kind of new. And I don't, it, I don't know who it, but Delta decided that a peanut allergy is more important or, or more dangerous than a tree nut or, you know, why do we have food allergy blanket policy so that any allergen could be respected. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate goal, but realizing like change, even getting them to put life-saving medication, even in vial form is, is like pulling teeth. So be understanding that, that uh, change is hard. And, and th those of us in this field are working really hard, often pro bono, not all, you know, and, you know, it, it's really hard when we get the criticism lobbed for us. Well, this should be important. And that, like, I can only tell my story. It's not that I can't, sh I can share the stories I have and I can tell my story, but, it, you know, and, and share concerns. But, you know, we need help. <laughs> we need help. So, yeah, speak up. Support what are us. the, oh, I'm sorry. What are the current protections we have legally? Pre board. Okay. Pre board. I mean, that, that again, you know, it's, it's, it's bigger protection than you think, 
because just like Ali said, like you get on early and you get that spot for your luggage, which means your <laughs> is protected, your auto injector is protected. Um, you you can make. I think the biggest risk, Ali, you can opine on this, but the biggest risk flying is that there is a contaminated surface. Meaning, I have a picture that Gwen Smith, or editor of Allergic Living, shared with me of a, a young girl. She, just shelling the biggest bag of nuts I've ever seen, like on a tray. And what if you were the passenger after that? What if it was Cheetos that was there before or, or pirate booty, whatever your allergen is, it, it could be on that tray. So getting on just a few minutes early and taking the time to wipe everything that that person could have touched. It's not paranoia. And um, I think that since COVID, Ali brought this up uh, when she and I were chatting, like it, it, you don't get the dirty looks anymore for doing it. You're not like the crazy OCD person that people think you are. Um, everybody's kind of lies to everything, area, right? right? Everybody's cleaning their area. So I think there are no other protections, but what this ruling did under Air Carrier Access Act and Mary Vargas and I, I literally, we were like champagne toasting from across states because what they said is food allergy is a disability. And that hasn't been said before. And they said it to the New York Times and they said it in the, in the decision. And so therefore we, we are gonna build from that. We have to find the right cases. There, there's stuff to go on from that, but you really can't sue an airline even if you die on an airline. <laughs> if it's from whatever cause it is, it's, it's almost impossible. And they have very thick insulations in that contract of carriage. So, you know, our best bet is, is trying to, to change policy. Even when I sat in on complaint resolution officer training, um, where they train airline employees not to get fined. And I would raise my hand and say, but that happened to people with food allergies. And they'd be like, you know, you're not really, we aren't accorded quite yet the same status as, as other disabilities. And Ali, I'd love you to talk about this. Using the word disability does not make you weak. We, that's how we're getting these policies. It doesn't, it doesn't. So I would love to hear your take on that. Yeah, I mean, growing up, the word disability had never even on the radar. I, I think there, you know, there wasn't anything legal for food allergies. I didn't know anyone growing up with food allergies besides my dad. I didn't have the single person that I knew. Like until I was on a trip when I was 16, almost 17, that I met somebody um, my age. So you know, it was, it was never, um, it's changed a lot, the landscape, because people like Leanne, who are, you know, out there advocating and um, organizations that are, you know, going to Capitol Hill and people who are, you know, actively seeking to get these um, things in place that will help people to really be able to have the accommodations that they need, whether that's something, in, you know, for them at university or, you know, college, or in school or however it is, or traveling, flying on a plane, whatever it is. Um, I personally, as someone with the food allergies, don't love to use the word. I'm glad that the word disability wasn't something that my parents ever used in front of me or was ever something that was, um, yeah, it was never something that, because I never felt weak because of my food allergies or like it was any sort of weakness. Um, and I think the word disability gets pushed around a lot and can easily, someone can think of it as a weakness, um, which is, that shouldn't be the case, but you know, it's really just being able to accommodate someone with differences of some kind. It's not, you know, there's no, it's a, it's not a really a disability is kind of, it's the way that we think about it is not really the way that I think we should think about it necessarily. It's really just accommodating people that have something that, you know, isn't part of the norm or whatever. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think that, and Mary has said that to me too, Mary Vargas, disability rights attorney um, who helped us get that DOT decision. It's, it's, you need to use this to be able to get an equal footing with yeah. everybody else so that you can fly safely, you know, be in school safely. It's not, there's, there should not be, any reluctance in using the term to to, to get those purposes accommodations because you know right. it's to be able to universally ask for the and know what your legal rights are it gives that yeah. i know what my rights are so if in that conversation it it's so important to be informed 
what is it that where what are my rights and and also as you both said what tone what how to be assertive but being assertive really starts with understanding what can i what can i specifically ask for and expect and kind of push back on and educate if i get a no so how about we have a question here what can you say to the person sitting next to you on a plane a train a bus if you have an allergy and they start eating something and you feel um, unsafe, you feel like it is a danger to you. What would you say? What would you? Yeah. I mean, I have numerous times just, and you know, it goes back to tone as well. And just the way that you approach it. These, I often, you know, especially when I was younger, had to remind myself, nobody knows, like you don't, actively see someone and know they have a food allergy there's no way that you can easily get offended like why is this person eating my allergen next to me you know because you think that they should know but they they don't know that you've been that allergy and that's making you feel anxious or uncomfortable so you kindly say like i have you know a really severe food allergy to to whatever it is peanuts that you're eating can you just you know, carefully eat them like more to the, to the other side of your chair or whatever it is. Or if you're really uncomfortable, do you have another, you know, asking for another snack they could eat instead? Um, you know, those peanuts are not going to jump over to you and your the likelihood of a, a reaction. You also have to sort of think in your head, it, it's not a very common thing that you're going to just because they're eating it next to you necessarily. Although, you know, everyone has their own reaction and comfort level, and that's totally fine. Um, but I, I think that being able to, you can advocate for yourself, and that is, you know, one area that I feel very comfortable advocating for um, in myself is, is being able to say that I feel uncomfortable, um, and this is how you can make me feel more comfortable, and, and doing it in a kind way. Like they don't know, and they're not trying to actively be a jerk because they have your allergen that they're eating. They don't, you know, people don't understand. And it's almost always somebody will be like, I have not really ever had anyone say no or be rude to me. And I think it's really about the approach. Um, you know, don't go accusing them of something. They don't even know that they're doing that's wrong. Um, there are situations like what Leanne dealt with with Joshua and, you know, it's, that could happen. And then you need to see if you can remove yourself from that situation, whether that's asking a flight attendant, you know, and telling them that, is there any other seats available? This is what's going on. Or, um, you know, finding a way to remove yourself from the situation or finding a way to feel more comfortable. You know, I carry before COVID, I always had like a bog mask with me um, that I could put on if I felt uncomfortable. You know, there's ways to, that you have control of trying to keep yourself comfortable in the situation, keep your anxiety down, focus on something else. It's not them. You can turn your body. There's, there's ways to, um, make the situation more comfortable for yourself, but you should, you should always feel like you can say something to somebody. We also want the advocacy groups that represent us and the physicians that treat us to know these stories because yes. they always understand that this is going on. Travel's never there's not enough time in an appointment. I think sharing these stories is something else. And, and then your physician, you could troubleshoot the scenario also with your physician and, and get their advice. But I will say that, you know, for the most part, you're okay, but humans are messy. We, are, we, we do not eat, live in a vacuum. And I have, you know, have gotten testimonials of people watching other people like shell nuts on their computer and then push like this to get rid of the dust. I mean, that is a scenario where something bad could happen. I do have an anaphylactic story of someone opening trail mix next to someone who had an allergy and they didn't inform the person next to them. And it was the vacuum seal and the nuts flew up in that person's nose and this young college student did go into anaphylaxis. So I do think it's important maybe to have the conversation politely before, like when we've flown and we have flown airlines that will not that don't have announcements, we have asked the people around us very nicely, like what Ali was saying. And we've done it before they, before they can start eating because, you know, you can like nip it in the bud if you say it in a nice way. And also I always carry extra snacks. So what if someone has diabetes and nuts is their only snack, you know? So I try to bring with a variety of snacks that I could like say, 
let me, or let me buy you a snack. Like if they're selling snacks, can I, can I buy you something that would be safe? And I've actually had people around me be really nice and be like, this is may contain, is that okay? You know, they won't be surprised. I mean, yes, you will encounter the nasty people. I'm not saying they don't exist, but you'll be surprised at some of, you know, if you approach the situation, like how far you can get with sugar as opposed to, or honey, whatever the quote is. I know we only have a couple minutes and Ali, I want to make sure, can you share the nature of the courses and your one-on-one -on -one consulting that you offer? Oh, sure. Uh, so I created at the um, fall of last year, I created a dining out with food allergies course. Uh, it has, you know, like all my top tips, strategies, how I dine out, Leanne's seen it in person. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I've had great feedback from it so far. And I, you know, I'm, I created it because people were asking for it. Um, and, you know, I've been part of this community for such a long time and have helped so many people with dining out. And it's just, it's hard to keep, it's hard to be able to help everybody. And this was a way for me to, um, you know, I spent a good chunk of a few months working on making a course that would really be able to guide people to feel like they can, you know, um, judge a situation, figure out how to, you know, find restaurants that they feel comfortable, form relationships with people, all of these things that, and, and how to deal with any sort of, um, you know, restaurant anxiety and, and sort of how to walk through some of that. Um, and so, yeah, so I created this course so that, you know, people who I know it's a really common struggle in the food allergy community of feeling comfortable to dine out and it can be really tricky and it's something that you know, I've worked on now for three decades. Um, and uh, it's the, the landscape of restaurants and just where people are at with understanding food allergies has changed significantly in those years. Um, but people still as the patron dining out need to know what they need to do because it's really, you know, it's a it's, it's a collaboration between the restaurant and you working together. It's not, you know, it's not one-sided and both need to do their part. And so, um, yeah, so the course is on Teachable. It's on, on my website and, and then- Miss Allergic Reactor. Allergicreactor.com. And um, I also offer one-on-one -on -one travel consults, which have been great. I've had so much fun doing them because, you know, it's, I love to be able to help and empower people to feel like they can travel abroad safely. And it's so fun to hear back from people afterward too. And they've had this safe trip and they feel so ready to go on their next one. And they're so excited about it. And before that, they didn't feel like they could comfortably travel. They were so nervous. And um, and yeah, it's absolutely, it's like my big passion is to be able to help people travel. Safely. You can tell you're a teacher. You're just impassioned by educating and empowering. So I want to hear as we finish up, both of you tell me what are the areas that of advocacy that continue to exist that are so important? Where are you both putting your efforts now? Leanne, where are you putting your efforts um, currently? The medical kits on planes is, is a big effort. I mean, since this latest article, I going on a panel with some Medscape uh, on Medscape to talk about it, two sets of panels with people who are, you know, stakeholders in, in this. And so I'm hoping that we can get some more energy into um, getting the right medications on planes. And again, survey that we're going to be launching and hopefully people will give us data and we'll have some holes uh, filled that we really don't know. And again, continuing to share the stories because like I said one of those family stories is responsible for all of us you know getting the right to pre-board an aircraft so never underestimate the power of the individual you you can make a difference anybody here can make a difference and so that's that's pretty much where I would leave it there's a lot of advocacy to be done and and don't expect too much of the people doing it because you don't know behind the scenes what kind of roadblocks they're up against and I know you're also talking about, you know, comedy as it relates to like making light or joking or mocking. Um, yeah. And you're doing work on that and bullying. So I know we want to have you back. So I don't want to talk about those things. And <laughs> be a whole three hour, you know, absolutely. But, but and just, just a quip on that is that, you know, when, when we allow these statements to go unchecked and, and Jim, again, I have to go back to Baker because he was so vocal about this not being okay and I'm so grateful that that he was there as, a, as an ally because 
you know, these situations in the air, the flight attendants, part of the reason they think it's so funny or, or, or make a joke or what happens is because they do think it's funny because it is, you know, we have marginalized this very real condition. And I do think it's the Rodney Dangerfield of disease. So again, you don't have to speak up and be nasty, but you know, it's not okay. You can say it's not okay and educate. I think we can. Mm -hmm. So I know we also want to talk to you more about how you've navigated, you and your family have been navigating sports at a highly competitive level. So involving a lot of travel, dealing with a lot of unfamiliar people settings. And I know people, sports and travel are two things that I think cause a lot of anxiety for parents. Like how can we even participate in those things safely? But I know we're out of time and we so appreciate both of you being here and all the time you took to work with us to really bring this information forward. So thank you, Allie. Thank you, Leanne. On behalf of the Wiser Center, we thank our audience. You came up with great questions for us today. We recognize the strength and perseverance of our food allergy community. And we believe always that with tools and support, you can do anything, including traveling safely anywhere you want to go. Please stay with me, and we're just going to end with a two-minute mindfulness practice as we think about needing tools to manage anxiety and stress related to situations we can encounter living with food allergies. So if everyone can take a moment and just take a deep breath, just notice what it feels like to be breathing paying attention to coming back, to just feeling the, the waves of your breath. Seeing if your next breath, you can take a deeper breath. Feeling your stomach. Noticing the inhale and the exhale. Take another intentional breath breathing from the soles of your feet up through your body, out through the top of your head, letting your shoulders fall, unclenching your jaw and your stomach. As you continue to do that, I'm gonna offer our, our food allergy families a challenge. So one thing we can do to help equip our kids um, and you know you as adults living with food allergy continuing to equip yourself is noticing what went well and applauding that noticing where there's been you know a growth in skills what went well what was i able to do how was i able to speak up how was i able to bounce back from something that didn't go as i hoped or I felt embarrassed, or I felt sad, or disappointed. So what went well? Recognizing, you could do this at dinner, you could ask once a week. This week, what did you notice that you were able to do that you didn't used to know how to do in relation to your food allergy? So are you practicing with your, um, with your auto injector? Are you practicing going through what what symptoms would I have? Uh, what does a reaction look like, feel like? How would I communicate that? Do I know how to take my medication? Do I know how to talk about that? So what did I do that I didn't used to be able to do? Or what did I try? What was a challenge for me this week? So that identifies an area that I can put more energy into and I can keep, I need to have some practice opportunities for that. So maybe it's, I really want to be able to go on a sleepover. I haven't done that yet. What would be the steps, as Leanne talked about, we're constantly, what's the next step to try to lead to where we want to go, which is ultimately independent management of your food allergy, like Allie. And then the third one, asking for support and putting words to something that you're struggling with, something that really may be uh, weighing on you. So regularly, what went well? What did you see yourself do? What was a challenge? So like, how did you step out of your comfort zone? What did you try? And then what was really hard and kind of you're feeling, 
not so good about. In this way, we continue to build resiliency. We continue to notice where we're more resilient than we used to be. So thank you, everybody. And we really appreciate you joining us. And if you know people who weren't able to join us today, make sure that you share that we have our library of videos on YouTube. And we have, we're up to 26 videos with all kinds of guests on all kinds of topics. And we really hope you'll look that up. Watch it with your kids, share it with family. It's another way to educate people in your community. Thank you.